Hello and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm your host, Kim Todd. We're happy you've chosen to spend the next hour with us as we answer those gardening questions. Unfortunately, this is a taped broadcast, so we won't be taking your calls tonight. You can still send us an email with pictures to byf at unl.edu. We do try to answer as many as we can for next week's final show of the season. So just give us as much information as you can, including where you live. Backyard Farmer is also available on our social media sites, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Pinterest. And as always, we start with a few samples. You have an escapee there, Wayne. Oh, it's still in my hands. It hasn't oh. escaped yet. It's not like last time I was on, we had an actual <laughs> escapee. All right, I have a yellow woolly bear caterpillar. Uh, they often show up this time of year in a lot of places. Some people see them crawling across the road. Uh, we have several generations a year, and they're usually not a pest species. And there we go. I can see it. They have several color forms. This is the lighter form. They can be almost a pure white, and they can also be very dark in coloration, like almost a black in color. And it just varies. Not, so if you see one, uh, right now, they're going to be looking for a place to spend the winter before too much longer. And in the spirit of three weeks ago when I was on, I got all those tiger moths to identify. This is another one of our tiger moth species. So it'll come out with a white wings uh, speckled in black with some orange on the abdomen. It'll be the adult. Perfect. Love woolly bears. Yes. Don't and care whether they do. This is also my son's a pet. A pet? Yes. Or a yes. Name? We, no, he hasn't named it yet. We found it on an outing to a wildlife management area on Saturday. So. <laughs> I say woolly. <laughs> we bully. We'll see if he agrees with you. Yeah. You have a kindergartner as well. <laughs> All right, Bill. Yep. Good I have turf grass. bed. Oh, imagine that. The turf guy. It's has exciting. Grass. Yeah. Well, it's been raining a lot, at least yeah. in the eastern half of the state, and so I thought this would be a great time to talk about the nitrogen cycle, right? Yeah. So nitrogen is the, <laughs> stop laughing. So nitrogen fertilizer is the fertilizer we put down on our lawns, make them greener. And um, when it's really, really wet in low areas, what can happen is the microbes in the soil um, are respiring, just like when we take oxygen in and we're breathing out carbon dioxide. Uh, when they get really wet, they can actually use nitrogen fertilizer to, to respire. And it's called denitrification. And so what we find is, the grass in those areas starts to look a little bit yellow. So here's an area that uh, the grass is kind of more of a yellow color. Uh, this is a low area, and so a lot of denitrification is happening. Nitrogen fertilizer is quickly being turned into gas and escaping the system and not greening our grass up. Versus a higher area, the grass is a greener color. It's a little bit better aerated. The plants, the microbes don't need to use that fertilizer to breathe, and so the plant can take it up, and so it looks greener. So if you are seeing, you know, your grass in those low areas looking yellow after all this rain, that's probably what's doing it. Uh, we don't want to put fertilizer down now because as long as it's wet, it's just going to keep doing it. About 95% of the fertilizer can be lost when the soils are wet and damp and warm like this. So let them dry out a little bit, and if it still looks kind of yellow, a little bit of fertilizer in those low areas can help to bring them back. Excellent. Thank you, Bill. All right, Amy, a rot or a spot? A rot and spot and both. So <clears throat> I have pear today, and I got this from Kyle in the clinic. But we usually talk about apples, but this is pear, and this is cedar pear rust. Mm -hmm. So very similar to cedar apple rust. We're, this time of year, we're getting these reddish to brown spots with orange halos. People are really concerned about them, seeing some yellow defoliation of their pears. When you flip it over, you can actually see the fruiting bodies or some little little hair sticking out of those spots. Those are the spores being reproduced that are going back to the cedar. So just like in cedar apple rust, we have to have the cedar and the pear to actually have the disease occur. If we take one of the hosts out of the cycle, the disease disappears, but that's not gonna happen. We still want our pears and we're not gonna get rid of cedar trees in Nebraska. So what you're stuck with is this time of year, as our leaves are starting to fall off, this is a great time for sanitation. We wanna to try to rake up as many of these leaves as possible. And then next spring, definitely make a note that you're gonna to wanna to put on a fruit fungicide spray when the leaves are just starting to emerge to protect it when it produces the spores from the cedars that come to the pear tree. Perfect, and we, we have seen that it is actually cultivar specific. Very interesting. Yeah, it so. is. All right, Elizabeth, a... I have grass. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, grass. <laughs> I have grass. No, um, 
what I have here is a really fun perennial grass. It's called sea oats. And it's fun, I like it because this, the seed heads are these really fun, large, flat, oat-like structures on here. And I know we've gotten some requests on, is it annual, is it perennial, is it a good guy, is it a bad guy? Um, this one is a perennial. And whether it's a good or bad guy depends. It, it tends to seed itself very readily. And so if you don't want all the seedlings to sprout up in that area, now would be the time to go ahead and cut this back because we don't want those seeds to ripen so they fall and then we've got that seed cycle. If you want it to kind of naturalize in an area, go ahead and let those seed heads stand throughout the winter. Um, it adds a, a fun winter interest for a while until these seed heads begin to shatter. Once they begin to shatter um, next spring, when we do our cleanup and, and cut back all of our ornamental grasses, that's going to be the time to remove those. So good guy, naturalizer over seeds can be kind of a thug if it, if it wants to take over. If you want an example, you can look at my gravel driveway <laughs> <laughs> filled with it, which is fine. All right, first picture. Wayne, this is an Omaha viewer. Uh, she didn't know what this was, but it's a, a Rudbeckia uh, or one of the sunflower related something or others. And she said they were fine and then they were crispy critters. Has never happened in eight years. And we were talking off air, we've seen this in cone flowers and some other things. Her real question is what to do to keep this from happening next year. As this is one of those years we've seen this and it's not been common before that, you may just need to wait till next year. Mm -hmm. um, if it is insect related, um, cut them open, stems open at signs and see if you can see some tunneling inside. Uh, to really know whether or not it is. The problem with the flowering plant like this that you're gonna have pollinators visiting is you, you're not gonna wanna treat it with anything, especially a systemic that would get something that's boring in the center of the stem. So that's not something we wanna do. Mm -hmm. uh, even if it is a topical, um, being as these were blooming when symptoms started to appear, it sounds like, again, you don't wanna apply an insecticide to a flowering plant because it's gonna be hard on our pollinators. I do see some firing from the edges on the leaves on this, so I don't know if Amy knows of anything that it could be on her side of the Well, table. if we look at the sunflower species, there's some botrytis that can move on there. There's also some sclerotinias uh, that can move on um, on the stem and cause some dieback. It, it's really hard to say, once again, uh, nothing that pops straight out saying this is the problem. It may be just because it was such a extremely wet year and a cool year for us. And next year you may not even see a problem with it. All right, so cut back and clean up yep. as mm -hmm. we're into that cycle anyway. All right, Bill, uh, this is a Gretna viewer. Okay. And he says, sure could use some help on okay. this one. He has researched brown spot, dollar spot, and several other spots. Yeah. Yes, it's spots and rots, but it's turf. Yeah, this is actually um, a great picture, so thank you for sending in a sample like this. Um, so we can really get a good look at it, especially this picture right here. When you really get to zoom in on it, you see, first of all, there's a mix of some bluegrass and some tall fescue based on the tall fescue's got some veins on it. And the tall fescue has brown patch and the bluegrass has dollar spot. <laughs> uh, very typical with this very wet weather we've had. It's uh, really great for this disease. Uh, they're both foliar diseases and eventually they will grow off. But with the community we've had the last three weeks, it's just been going, going, going. So if you really can't tolerate it, um, going to get some kind of a fungicide that something like a propiconazole or a, something similar to that, um, chlorothalonil. Uh, look at the label, make sure that those two diseases are on it and do an application to try to get some cured, uh, curative control. All right, thank you, Bill. All right, Amy, um, this is a Grand Island viewer, Elizabeth, <laughs> and he says all his peppers are in pots. He's never had this happen before. He wonders what it is, how to prevent it in the future and they're both California Wonders and the Chocolate Bell Peppers. So outside, inside on this one. All right, so this is anthracnose, which is a very common fungal disease that we'll see on peppers. Uh, it's, it goes to several hosts, it will go on tomatoes too. But what happens is this fungal infection doesn't actually cause infection until those peppers are almost ripe, which makes this an awful evil disease. Because you've been sitting there waiting for it and then all of a sudden you got this big nasty blackness going on. Um, it's one of those that is a, can be somewhat of a challenge to manage. The spores are naturally in our environment, so there is some differences in cultivars, so you could look at that way. The other good thing to do is, if you're seeing a major problem, even for the rest of this year, 
right before those peppers are mature and when they're susceptible, go ahead and pick them early because your peppers will continue to mature on your table. So pick them and then take them inside and wipe them off and that would remove any spores and that also removes any humidity that will allow that spore to germinate. Uh, that's gonna be your easiest solution. Plus it becomes a natural odor friendly uh, member of your garden in your house. I like the smell of peppers and so I'll pick them and instead of having air fresheners, I'll put peppers out. So you get two for one that way. You're weird. <laughs> I like peppers, sorry. <laughs> Elizabeth, on that note, this is a viewer in Kearney and we saw this all the way up to Haskell and back three or four weeks ago. Uh, he says these have been growing on the cedars for years. They've always pulled them off. This year they got away from him, didn't know it had seed pods with all these stickers. And he's wondering, can he use a pre-emerge on this or what is this exactly? So what it is, is it's an annual vine called burr cucumber. And if you see the little seed pods, they look like little tiny burrs on there. But because it's an annual, what you're going to want to do is try to remove it or rip it off of the tree, if at all possible, or at least uh, pull up the roots while they're small. Um, there is not a product that will be able to spray over the top of the trees or the windbreak and only kill the burr cucumber. So you're looking at either hand removal. You can do a pre-emerge in the spring. Um, commercial guys can get a product called Princep that they can put down, or for us home gardeners, we can put down any pre-emergent um, to help control that. Because it's an annual vine, we're looking at applying it and getting it down so that way it doesn't get started. Once it's already up and going, like I said, it's got a shallow root system, so you should be able to pull it. Because it's got the burrs on it now, I try to remove as much of that seed source so next year you don't have a big problem. And yes, to the viewers who said, is kudzu taking over the state of Nebraska? Not kudzu. <laughs> well, recently a family of beavers decided to make their home on campus on the north side. Our critter guy, Dennis Ferraro, was called in to assess the issue and it was discovered the beavers are actually a benefit to the surrounding area. Here's Dennis to tell us why the beavers are allowed to stay. About a year and a half ago, uh, a pair of beavers decided to dam this small intermittent stream uh, right on campus. And I was first called in to say, oh, there's a beaver on campus, how do we get rid of it? I came out here to find they created what they're supposed to, a habitat, a perfect habitat. Not only are they creating the habitat, they are taking only the trees that our landscape services were going to take out to make their dam. They're not touching the value trees and the nut trees in this area. Also, their dam is taking pressure off the way we get back and forth on the stream below me and pressure off the where where this stream feeds into an NRD stream. So the beavers are saving the university and the state probably several thousand dollars a year by maintaining this dam. And we don't have to pay them anything. Since the beavers built this dam, we have frogs, turtles, ducks, and many other wildlife coming to the area. We have trail cams so we can monitor it. And we're knowing now that this beaver habitat is not causing any flooding. It's just maintaining itself. They're maintaining it at the right level within its banks. They have a hut, and we believe we have a couple of pieces of data that show that our pair of beavers at least had one young this year. So let's look, if you have a beaver dam, but you're afraid it's gonna flood an area, there's something you can do to maintain, keep the beavers happy and stop any flooding. Okay, if you're in a place where you think the beaver dam may cause some flooding upstream, or the beaver dam is becoming too high, you can put in what we call a dam leveler. This is a mock-up. They're usually not this thin. Usually they're a foot and could be two foot in diameter. So think about this being very much larger. This pipe would go up 10 to 15 feet into the pond. And this side of the pipe that has holes on the bottom would be 10 to 15 feet on that side of the dam. You just dig a trench, you bury this down, and you have this at the level of where you want to keep or your water level. You're going to make a wire cage around it. Of course, the wire cage is going to be probably four foot by four foot. And it's going to be in the middle of the pond, or at least 10 to 15 foot out there. 
You're gonna bury this about a foot down in, if not deeper. You're gonna bury it low enough that the top of this is even with the water level you wanna maintain. So that way, the water is going down and keeping that same level out down the stream, yet the dam is not being compromised and the beaver won't build a dam any higher. If you still wanna maintain the beaver and you're afraid that there is some trees that they possibly can take, you can easily protect the trees from the beaver by using just drain tile. This happens to be only three inches. You can get ones that are four inches up to three foot. You cut it in half with a circular saw, put the two halves around the tree, and you would do this four foot up. And then you can put bands or ties so the tree can grow, yet the beavers would not, even though the beaver can probably get through this, the beaver won't touch the tree if it's protected by this material. And you put that around all the trees within, say, four, 20 feet of the edge of your pond in upstream. So leave it to beaver, let him do his job. They're an important part of the ecosystem and they can be a benefit. I don't know how we follow that, actually. <laughs> Beaver dams, for the most part, can really be beneficial because many other vertebrate animals do rely on the wetlands. They can, however, sometimes be dis disruptive due to that unintentional flooding. For now, we're really happy to have them around, and it is a great teaching tool for our favorite critter guy, who is just a hoot. <laughs> All right, pictures next. So... Let's see, we have a one, two, three ID for you, Wayne. The first is a really good picture from a viewer in Hastings. Um, she's two to two and a half inches long, fly low to the ground in an erratic pattern. What is it? Is it a good guy? First of all, I gotta compliment them on taking such a fantastic picture. Mm -hmm. Without size comparison in this, I was able to look at the how sturdy the mandibles, their teeth were on this thing to tell whether it was a steel blue cricket hunter or the blue mud dauber wasp. Mm -hmm. And so this one is the steel blue cricket hunter. Okay. And if, now that you've got the size, that fits also, it's a lot bigger. Yeah. The erratic behavior flying over the lawn is it's looking for crickets. Crickets, To Perfect. stash in its nest for it to lay its egg on and then it'll hatch and consume the crickets. Perfect, all right, so your second one is actually from Northwest Iowa. Uh, she she's, thinks it's a bee, but it does have a band on its abdomen. Yes, this is a bee. Okay. It's one of our solitary bees, and it's in a genus called Sphastra, but that doesn't mean anything, and our, probably to our listeners. It's in a group called the longhorn bees, and they get the name mm -hmm. from the males, have very long antennas. Some of them are longer than the length of the body, which is very unusual within bees in general. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's what it is. Okay. It's a pollinator. <laughs> okay, perfect. A pollinator. There we go. <laughs> All right, and the third one here is La Vista, and he says he's never had these before. They're swarming around his cucumbers, and I'm guessing he meant musk melons. It got corrected in email to mouse melons. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta love autocorrect. Yeah. Oh, so what these are, these are a type of scolian wasp called the blue-winged wasp. And we're real creative on names here. But the upside on these, and why he's never seen these before, is they are uh, parasitic on things like June beetles and Japanese beetles. And Excellent. given the recent boom of Japanese beetles in Omaha, we may be seeing a boom of these blue winged wasps that Perfect. like to feed on them. Yeah, feed away. All right, Bill, you have actually just a single viewer sent an interesting question and mm -hmm. some pictures. His questions on these were, uh, he used Q4 on the crabgrass. Yep. He aerated four times over the goose grass. And then his question is, can he overseed in two weeks? So I think we're assuming on this, what we're seeing is yeah, it looks it looks like ABC here. It looks like yeah. death of weeds, and yeah. so he was uh, successful in that part, which is actually really an accomplishment this time of year. Sometimes they can be a real bear to kill uh, this time of the year. Uh, but he appeared to have done it. What I would probably do before you seed is just try to get some of that dead tissue out of there. Maybe use like a power rake or something. Try to you know uh, get that out of the way, and then try to get that seed pressed into that soil. Good seed to soil contract. You know, always whenever you're worried about is it safe to seed, look at those labels. They have a ton of information in them. If you're unsure about something or any type of a product you're applying, read that label. And if you don't know too, feel free to contact the manufacturer and ask that question. But uh, I have seen no problem in two weeks of doing that seeding. All right, excellent, thanks, Bill. 
Okay, this is an Omaha viewer, Amy, and this mm -hmm. is a Diablo 9 bark. She's had it for 16 years. All of a sudden, she's seeing this. She did say it's under a locust with bagworms, which has nothing nope. to do with this. Um, but she saw this, and then she dug a little deeper, literally, and she found this kind of messy thing at the, at the root okay. on this. So there's actually two things. So we'll start with this one here. This is at the base of the crown of that nine bark. We got some crown rot occurring just because it's been extremely wet. So you're gonna wanna pull back as much of that mulch as much as possible. I know you've gotten anywhere from four to five to 10 inches of rain in the last week. Um, so it's still gonna be hard to dry it out, but try to dry it out as best as you can. Now on the leaf, I've looked at it, I've gone back and forth. Typically with nine bark, what we see is powdery mildew is our primary culprit. But looking at this, it doesn't quite look like powdery mildew. Powdery mildew typically won't cause the leaf to blister up. And so it would want me to lean toward another disease that I'm not real sure on. So to be absolutely positive on this, you really need to send a sample into Kyle into the plant pest diagnostic clinic. That way he can verify, is it powdery mildew or is it something else? Because if it's another fungal leaf spot, which we're kind of leaning toward, management is a totally different beast. And we don't want to give you the wrong recommendations. So all you need to do is just nip off those little leaves there, put them in a Ziploc bag, mail them to Kyle, and his address at the Plant Pest Diagnostic Clinic is 448 Plant Sciences Hall in Lincoln, Nebraska, 68583-0722. And he'd be very happy to take a look at it. Um, tell him that you sent the uh, picture to BYF and he'll totally understand what's going on and Kyle will get you a response back really fast. Perfect, and good memorization on that one. That's five years of working there, kind of <laughs> sticks with you forever. There you go. All right, Elizabeth, this is a Carney viewer. Sent us a picture, actually, first of the foliage and, and the stem, which we really appreciate, and then of the flower. And she's wondering, is this a weed or is this a desirable perennial? Again, it, it's kind of like the sea oats that we had earlier. It depends on your outlook. What it is, is it's called obedient plant. And the reason it's called obedient plant is you can actually like maneuver those stems and those flowers around. So it's kind of like, you know, Play-Doh moving it around on there. Not quite that easy. Um, it's in the mint family. It's got a square stem, but because it's in the mint family, it's going to spread by rhizomes. It's going to spread by seeds. Um, there's a cultivar out there called Miss Manners that's supposed to be a little bit more behaved. Um, Supposed to is the key word with that one, but it's a it's a really nice plant and I, and it kind of likes those wetter kind of environments too. So uh, it's just a fun one to try. There's that that pinky mauve kind of color, and then there's white too. Exactly, and ours was very disobedient in our backyard farmer garden. Mm -hmm. And then you've got this one, which is actually a viewer in Iowa, and he's wondering what this one is. That one is actually a weed this time. It's called toothed spurge. Tooth spurge will have that milky sap that all the Euphorbiaceae's have, um, and it spreads by seeds. So if you don't like it, um, it's actually seeding right now. The um, flowers aren't really that showy on any anything in that family. So go ahead and remove it, pull it, um, and then hopefully uh, you get rid of that seed bank for next year. All right, thank you, Elizabeth. You know, it's been a great season out in our garden. We've really enjoyed being able to show you every single week from planting to planting and of course, growing to harvest. Let's take a minute to hear from Ter Terry James about this year's Backyard Farmer Garden. This year in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we have really stepped up our game. We've had not a lot of additions to the garden, but some of our additions are pretty cool. We got a really neat garden shed that has really helped us out, especially with our grow row where we can stage and have all of you gardeners bring your extra produce to us and have a great reception area. We've also had that new irrigation system in that we put in last fall. As you remember, we checked it all out. We measured where all of the water was going and made sure that it was evenly distributing water across our garden. We're really looking forward to having that in the future and maybe even expanding it. We had some great All-America selection winners. We had a really weird spring. Remember, it was really cold for a long time, had one of the record lows in April ever. And then in May, it just got hot and humid 
and it kind of stayed there for the rest of the summer. We had a great year in the backyard farmer garden. Hope you stop by sometime this fall and check it out because it looks gorgeous. See you in the backyard farmer garden next year. We'll visit the garden one more time this year as next week we will show you six months of gardening in a three minute time lapse. And that's always really fun because we forget too that you go from zero to that in six months. All right, regular questions. This is a tomato problem, but it's an army worm problem. Wayne, uh, she did find army worms. Uh, this is, she's in Waterville, Kansas. And she used a spray, uh, she doesn't see any more worms, but she's got one or two holes close to the stem, and of course they ruin half the tomatoes. She's really wondering how can she stop this or prevent it next year for the worm-like feeders on her tomatoes. Sounds like a fruit tree spray schedule if you're gonna go that far. If you're gonna start it, you're gonna have to go with it for a long time because these products are not good for forever. And if you still have blooms on the plant, you're going to need to avoid the blooms so that you continue to produce tomatoes. Uh, if you're going to do that, uh, with caterpillars, you can use a product that contains carbaryl. I would alternate that with a different mode of action, so something that's got a permethrin or something like that. Those are two of our very common uh, garden insecticides that have a little bit shorter pre-harvest intervals that we can usually manage around. All right, so nothing you can do to keep the army from the, out of the garden. No, not really. The, the, when they're when the moths can fly in and out at their own doing, keep, yeah. it's hard. Net your yard. Okay, got it. <laughs> All right, so we have a rough bluegrass question, Bill. Okay. Um, apparently, the rough bluegrass is coming in to this person's yard. Um, Does that? Yeah, they 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 don't want it to happen, and they do what sounds like huge lawn care management in their own lawn. So how do, how do they keep that from happening? Yeah, well, the first thing is rough bluegrass loves shade and it loves wet soils. So if you have shady environment and you're keeping things too wet, it's gonna be really ideal for it. If you keep your lawn on the drier side, you can really help keep that grass from heading in. It's stoloniferous, which means it has stems that crawl on the surface. And so it's going to try to creep in. If you can try to you know, manually keep it clean the best you can, otherwise, you know, non-selective herbicides are your real only way of keeping it out of your lawn. Ooh. Are we ready? Yes. Elizabeth, this is an Omaha viewer who says his jalapenos are turning black. Why and are they still good to eat? Sometimes they're gonna do that, sometimes they turn red and other colors. So yep, they're perfectly fine to go ahead and eat. All right, we have a North Platte viewer who has a four foot redbud seedling from a neighbor's yard with a double trunk, is wondering when that can be moved safely. You can go ahead and move it this fall. Um, you just wanna transplant it. The only kicker is, is if it's got a double fo a forked trunk, I don't know if that's the best one that you wanna try to do, but if you wanted to, anytime now. All right. Uh, this is a viewer who says their ash loses its leaves every Labor Day. Is this a disease or is this what? It's an environmental thing. Just enjoy the ash as long as possible. <laughs> we have a Blair viewer who solarized, wants to plant perennials. How long should she leave that plastic off and should she use a pre-merge? Um, so you want to leave that plastic off to allow that soil to go ahead and breathe. So I'd go ahead and they can plant those perennials yet this fall. Um, I'd put a pre-emergent down just in case there are some henbit or some other winter annuals that could be germinating in that area. Nice job. A little lightning, but not like we had the other mm -hmm. night. <laughs> okay. Are you ready, Amy? Yes. So. If powdery mildew does not like free water, why did it show up in eastern Nebraska overnight after six inches of rain? It's because we had a lot of humidity in the air. Our dew point was at, what, 85 degrees, which is unheard of. All right. We have a viewer who has asked us whether th thousand cankers in walnut has been identified yet, or, or have you not seen it? It has not been found in Nebraska. It's been found in Kansas and Colorado at this time. All right. We have a York viewer who, who says her grapes are ripening, but then they turn black and they kind of shrivel up. That is beautiful botrytis blight that loves all of our small fruits. All right. uh, fungicide applications. When? Um, with that, you're gonna follow it according to grapes and you're gonna start the minute the grapes start to set on all the way up until harvest and you'll have to look at those pre-harvest intervals. 
All right. We have a tree with a canker on the trunk. Is there any hope other than... There's no hope. It's a great time to look at replacing it this fall yet. All right. Do ash bolete mushrooms just come up around ash trees? Typically, yes. It only likes ash. Okay. Thank you. Nice job. I told my friend's daughter Caroline I was going to win for her today, and then she pulled out a six, so I'm a little <laughs> bit nervous. That's all I'm saying. I took, one for, the, took one for the team and didn't answer very many. <laughs> That's the best it. I've ever done. <laughs> okay, this is a central, south central Nebraska viewer who wants to know uh, it's too wet to prepare the seed bed, so how long is the seeding window? Yeah, we still, if. Uh, this time of year, we, we still a little bit of a window going. Uh, tall fescue particularly, um, but you're probably looking at middle to end of September, so let's let try it to dry out. All right. Uh, after using triclopyr, how long do you have to wait to reseed? I would consult the label because each label might have a different number, and so just want to verify that. Okay. How do you control violets in bluegrass this time of year? Uh, we're a little bit early, and um, something with triclopyr would be really helpful, and maybe two applications, but again, start the application may be uh, closer to our first frost. All right, and when and how do we control clover in the lawn? Same answer. And when and how do we control Creeping Charlie? Same answer. <laughs> so what are the best seed mixes for Eastern Nebraska? This is an Omaha viewer. We like uh, the tall fescue seed mixes because uh, they just are better adapted and better suited um, to our, our climate. But uh, make sure you get certified seed um, and you know where the source is and the breadth of variety is. All right, so we have a viewer who, and I'll ask you this one. Yes. Barrier, she wants a barrier between zoysia and the landscape bed. She doesn't want it to creep in. Is that even possible? It's gotta be pretty deep. Those rhizomes are gonna go down about six inches, and so you need to have you know, a deep, some kind of a physical barrier to go down for that. Okay. There you go, Caroline. I think he's playing favorites. <laughs> hey. Come on. Come on. Are you ready, Wayne? You don't know. I, he might I may win. have to pull out a Lauren here. <laughs> All right. This is a Richland, Nebraska viewer who is wondering why their lawn is full of crickets. Just this time of year. Okay. This is an Omaha viewer. They, it is a ground nesting, looks like a wasp or a something in a one and a half by three inch hole. Is that a good guy or a bad guy? Uh, most of our ground nesting wasps are going to be preying on other insects, and so they're a good guy. All right. A little black inchworm with a giant orange head is eating barberry in Oakland. Any ideas on that one? Not sure on that one particular one, there's a lot of caterpillars it could be. Okay, do wolf spiders come in different colors? Yes, they do vary a little bit in coloration. All right, so how about praying mantises? Do they depend on, do they change based on what they're on? Color depends on environment that they're in. Okay, uh, we are still seeing swallowtail larvae out in our garden. Is it getting late for them to actually become? They will overwinter as a pupa, so no, it's not too late. All right. This is a viewer who has tiny white worms in strawberries. Ooh, that sounds like it could be spotted wing drosophila, Ooh. which will attack undamaged fruit. Ooh. So. That's not a good thing to hear. No. I'm, it's we're established gonna, we're gonna across pretend, the state. We're going to pretend I didn't answer, ask you that. <laughs> All right, Elizabeth. Well, I didn't plans, need Bill. <laughs> plans I, I kindly read. only tied Amy. <laughs> All right, plants of the week, Elizabeth. So plants of the week, um, what we have is, we're just gonna start with the tallest one in here. What this is, is it's a switchgrass, and it is a selection from a native. It's called Dallas Blues. And it's really cool because it's got this steely blue kind of color. Um, the seed heads are really big and open and airy. The kicker is, is when we get a lot of moisture, like this year, um, it's gonna flop. And so then you're looking at having to stake it up or support it in some way. If we don't get quite as much moisture with a lot of these ornamental grasses, we're not gonna see them flop open quite as, as readily. Um, but when we get a lot of moisture, watch out because they're just gonna open up and, and then they're not nearly as pretty. The yellow one is a really fun one called Zigzag Goldenrod. Um, it's a native with an unusual form. So it has a zigzag leaf that kind of goes back and forth and then it's got the solidago leaf that's kind of got some tooth margins on it. Um, so with the, any of the goldenrods that are out there right now, we're seeing a lot of pollinators out there, especially the little soldier beetles are out there collecting their pollen um, and going on and feeding with those. 
And then the purple one is the bottle gentian, um, part shade, kind of a woodland edge, kind of a, a beast right there. And it's really fun because what happens is, is a bee will stick its little head down in there and it'll pull those petals apart and then they'll, they'll get in there to get the pollen and nectar and then they pop back out. So it's a really fun uh, flower to kind of watch a little bumblebee butt stick out of because um, it's just, you know, fun to see. It's pretty um, cool. Yeah. All that good stuff. So. All right, nice combination. Thank you, Elizabeth. All right, pictures next. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, Wayne, this is, a, this is a viewer in Bellevue. Found this while cutting down the ash and says they were all over and of all sizes. And what are they and what should be done about them short of he already you're, cut down the ash? You're going to not like me on this one, too. Uh -oh. That is a brown marmorated stink bug oh. nymph. Yeah. And that's an invasive, and mm -hmm. come this fall, you may have a large number trying to get in your house if you've got that many of them running around. And I think we had this last week, too, as they're beginning to be more prevalent. All right, yeah. thank you. So this is a weed for you, Bill. This is to you nope. redeem your... Oh, I'm nope. sorry, this, nope. is the, this is the little mite thing. This is, so she, she thinks this is a little mite. This is Modale, Iowa. Um, she's finding them all over. They move very fast. They're a little bigger than the size of a pinhead. It just might be a mite. <laughs> a mighty I mite. Could, I could not resist that A mighty one. mite. Uh, yeah. Yes, it has the eight legs, uh, so they are an arachnid. Uh, it's very tiny. Most of those are going to be an arachnid. It has the what I would typically call the body form with the kind of looks like it's lumped together. It's not separated like a spider will sometime be between the two body parts. And it's got the small protruding mouth parts coming out the front. So it's yes, it's a mite. It's hard to know what kind it is based on that level. And it can be very difficult to identify what they actually are. All right. Thank you so much. Now the weed, Bill. The weed. So you can redeem yourself on not knowing weeds on this one. It's pervasive in the roadbed, low to the yep. ground. They think it smells like licorice when it's cut, but his wife thinks it smells like dill. Some people think it smells like pineapple. Because? It's pineapple weed. So that's <laughs> a, I, I guess I never actually smelled it. I've seen it a lot, but everybody at this table apparently smells a lot of pineapple weed. It's an annual. <laughs> it, it, uh, it, it likes these kind of compacted soils. It's got a short tap root. Um, you could try to pull it, but it's pretty, like you said, pervasive. Um, if you're worried about, you know, if that's supposed to be lawn, thinking about maybe aerating and trying to uh, manage that soil, that the uh, that lawn might be a little bit more competitive, might be something to try in the future. But All right. and it's actually edible. So you can even eat pineapple weed. It's amazing. You do everything. It smells great. You can eat it. It grows in bad soil. I mean, what a Perfect. what a plant. <laughs> All right. Amy, this is a viewer with a cherry tree that mm -hmm. she says is starting to show these terrible symptoms. So there's the tree itself. Um, perhaps not the, not the greatest tree on the face of the earth. And then I believe we have some foliage pictures on okay. this one. So as with most of our fruit trees, it has a leaf spot. Cherry is very prone for leaf spots. Now, when you looked at the full tree, it looked a little sad. So it could be some premature defoliation there. You can see it, especially there on the left-hand side. Some premature defoliation could be occurring because of that leaf spot. I would also want you to go and check to see if there's any canker because that one branch looks to be really, really defoliated, probably indicating something else is going on. Um, so take a look at those. You may need to prune it back uh, and you'll just have to wait for next year to see how it goes. To control that leaf spot, you're gonna use a fruit tree fungicide spray. You're gonna start at emergence of the leaf and keep going on through because there's a lot of diseases that will attack the leaves and the fruit of cherries, and you're best starting that program beginning of the spring and keep going through until you harvest your cherries. All right, thank you. Elizabeth, this is a Valley viewer, Valley, Nebraska. They have pros and cons on a linden. The pro is it shades the house when the Japanese beetles don't eat the foliage. The cons, it's light, lot, uh, lopsided, storm damage, removal of branches, um, landscaping around the base, the root system has grown above the grass line, there's lots of water sprouts. Is it a safety concern? What would we recommend on this one? So when it comes to trees, and especially linden, certain tree species are known for suckering and for shallow root system, and linden are no uh, exception to that rule. 
I was okay with the lopsidedness and the wonky looking tree until we got to the picture of the trunk. And when we get to the picture of the trunk and we have that um, retaining wall block planter around it, and it looks like it's a post in the ground, we have no root flare whatsoever. Um, that's kind of my red flag right there. It's not an immediate hazard, but it is one that I would consider removal at some point in time. Right, yeah, we, we don't like to see that sort of well around a tree, it doesn't work. All right, thank you, Elizabeth. Another confirmed sighting of emerald ash borer means we need to update you on what you should and should not be doing with your ash trees. Let's hear from two experts, backyard farmer panelists Jonathan Larson and Lori Stepanek from the Nebraska Forest Service about the latest news. With the recent find of emerald ash borer in the Lincoln, Nebraska area, we've been getting a lot of questions about this particular beetle and what people need to be doing now to try and protect their trees. The good news is that you have plenty of time to make a decision, but this is a very pesky insect. It's an invasive beetle. It was accidentally shipped to the United States, probably in some packaging material in the late 1990s. It was first discovered in Michigan in 2002, and it's since spread to over half the United States. We're one of the newer states that's been impacted, and we're gonna have to start making some decisions about our trees. But first, we have to understand the pest a little bit better. And that, to do that, we're gonna have to talk about it's an invasive species that doesn't have a lot of defenses against it here in this country, and it likes to attack ash trees. Those are its food sources. It's not gonna get into maples or oaks or anything else like that. It loves blue ash, white ash, green ash, all the different ash species that we grow here in Nebraska. If you don't protect your tree, it will be lethal to that tree over the course of about seven to 10 years. The larva will feed inside of the cambium layer, which is under the bark. That is the part that transmits nutrients and water throughout the plant. And once they devour all of that, the tree will be kaputsky. If you're trying to figure out what, if your tree is infested, you can look for some symptoms such as epicormic shoots at the base of the tree. Those are extra limbs with extra leaves that the tree is putting out to try and save itself. If you cut a tree down and you see any D-shaped exit holes, or if you start taking the bark off of the tree and you see these winding serpentine tunnels, that's an indicator that emerald ash borer is in that tree that you cut down and may be in some of the ones that are surrounding it. There's been a number of questions from homeowners by, uh, about treatments. Uh, treatments include trunk injections and soil treatments. Uh, we highly recommend though that homeowners go with a professional arborist uh, as they will have better, um, more effective treatments than what's available to homeowners. Um, there are several things to consider if you want to treat your trees for emerald ash borer. Uh, are you within the 15 mile treatment uh, consideration zone, which is basically a zone uh, 15 miles around the known infestations in Lincoln, Omaha, Fremont, or Greenwood? Um, the best time to treat trees is in the spring, so we are recommending that people wait at this time to begin treatments in the spring. And then finally, um, be selective about the trees that you want to treat. Um, they should be in good health, good condition. They should be sited properly in the landscape. Uh, and they should be valuable to you as a homeowner. Um, if you do not treat your trees, they will eventually be killed by emerald ash borer and will need to be removed. So whether you decide to treat your trees or remove them, uh, it's best to go with a professional arborist. Uh, they have the uh, equipment for taking down trees, which is a very dangerous job. This is and will really become a more serious situation as more confirmed sightings continue. But as we've just heard, we don't recommend treating your high value ash trees until spring. Meanwhile, you've got time to inspect, evaluate the health of your own trees and make some decisions about whether you're going to treat them or not. So it's that health of the tree. All right, picture questions. Your first one is Lincoln, this huge caterpillar, Wayne, ate the leaves off a plant. Uh, is it some kind of a horn to something or other? <laughs> a hornworm? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The hawk moth group as a whole, uh, most of the caterpillars have that little telltale horn on the back end that looks like a tail. This one's kind of hard to tell because you need to see it directly from the side to be able to tell if the patterning truly is either 
The closest I could come with it is either it's a tobacco hornworm or a tomato hornworm. It's really hard to tell from a dorsal view like this. You really need it from the side okay. to tell for sure. And if you want to keep it for next year and not have them on there, manual inspection. These things get big. They're easy to find yourself. And then, you know, brick A, caterpillar, brick B, and squish we're done. it. <laughs> All right, so you have a second one, which is a photo of a moth. Appears to be a mix of a white line sphinx and a tomato hornworm moth. Is he right? It's in the same group. Yeah. Uh, it's not a white line sphinx because of all the pink on it. And it's not a uh, tomato hornworm or the other one because it's got pink spots instead of yellow. This is a pink spotted, surprise, hawk moth. Perfect. Yep. Um, it's one of our natives. Yeah. Enjoy it. Perfect. And then your third is actually they were digging potatoes and found this and it moved. So they yes. put it back. <laughs> what is it? Yes. Uh, so this is an, a hawk moth. Mm -hmm. Chrysalis. Mm -hmm. It's not a true cocoon because it's not coated in silk. Mm -hmm. So this is a chrysalis. And that long loop is actually the proboscis that the adult moth will have. Perfect. Perfect. And since they found it in the garden, most likely it's going to be one of the pest species. Oops. That you probably... You may want to go back out there with the spade Dig and find it. it. And kill it. Yeah. All right. Bill, this is a viewer who said they kill their weeds and their weedy grasses. Mm -hmm. And there, I think there are a couple pictures here. This is the kill, obviously. And then they're, what they're really wanting to know is what is the best way to establish good turf that matches the existing turf? Yeah. Uh, first thing, you want to identify what kind of grass you have there. It looks like you have tall fescue when I zoomed in on the pictures. Um, so then if you're trying to establish it, you know, simple things, scalp off the dead tissue, use this drop seeder, seed it with the drop seeder, and then try to use some type of uh, uh, mechanical means to try to push it in the ground, an aerator or a power rake. Put down a, a starter fertilizer and, and keep it wet uh, if Mother Nature doesn't do that for us. <laughs> so, pretty simple. Yeah, all right, perfect. <laughs> Amy, you have a one, two, three, it's okay. shroom time. Uh, the first is, could, couldn't find this, um, couldn't figure this one out on his own. He wonders what they are. He thought puffball. Um, it is a type of puffball. Okay. Um, it is edible, doesn't cause a lot of problems breaking down dead organic matter. Okay, but we don't recommend We don't recommend them unless you know for sure, but exactly. some of them are. Perfect, and then I think our second one here is, this is where a sump pump dumps into the yard. She's noticed it in years past, not as back. She's afraid it's a black mold or a mold of some sort. And is it is it that and and is it harmful? It's moth and algae. It's just because it's so stinking wet there. Mm -hmm. um, by the looks of it, it looks like your drain is underground. If it wasn't, if it's a uh, a pipe on the, above the ground, maybe you need to be moving it around a little bit, angling it so it isn't going in the exact same spot all the time. Once it dries up, it will go away. All right, excellent. And your third one here is we've gotten three or four of these, even though we've had this on air as a mm -hmm. sample. What is this? And the one person is wondering whether he should spray something on it. Okay, so this is an ash bolt. Uh, B-O-E-L-T-E -E is how you spell it. Um, you're going to find it associated with ash roots at all the time. And when I was up in the department this afternoon, I was talking to Jerry Adams, and he said, they believe this one grows on the roots of the ash tree and is parasitic to insects that are feeding on the ash roots. So it is very beneficial. Wonder if those emerald ash borers know this. I, emerald ash borers aren't feeding on the feeding roots. On the roots I, so I know, it was just a thought. You it know, is, maybe they... so, so he's a good guy. So you kind of want to leave him alone. All right. Sure. Cicadas could be feeding on cicadas. Those are root feeders. There you go, perfect. And the nymphs. All right, Elizabeth, this is a Northwest Missouri viewer. Uh, she watches our show. She has a hydrangea that she planted. She hasn't pruned it. She thinks she has two plants in one. She's wondering, does she? And should she? what should she do about this? So the answer is kind of. Um, what happened is you had one of the limelight-like hydrangeas. Um, so it reverted back to the straight species. And so the limelight is the one with the yellow cone-shaped um, panicle of flowers on there. The straight species is the one that's kind of not quite as pretty, but still very nice. 
So what you can do on the straight species is go ahead and prune it out as much as you possibly can. And then when it's time um, this fall to go ahead and cut back that limelight. And you can cut them back kind of hard because then it's going to send new, new sprouts up from those leaf axles and, and you're going to have all sorts of flowers on there. Um, and then you're going to control the size a little more with, with those limelight. But you've got a, a two for one. Um, if you like it, leave it. If not, uh, the straight species is probably going to win over the limelight. Light. Good, and we usually prune ours on campus in March with my class. There you which go. Is perfect. All right, we have a couple of announcements of fun things going on in the gardening world. We'll toot our own horn one last time. BYF on location at Midwest Hops Producers, Wednesday the 12th, QA 515, taping 6 to 7. You have the address on screen, and that is something that actually does not cost anybody anything unless you come early and you want to buy a beer. Yep. Four <laughs> and, our, and our second one is, of course, Grow a Row produce donations. We are still accepting them 5 to 7 p.m. in the backyard farmer garden on East Campus. I suspect we will be accepting those for the rest of the season. And that doesn't mean our ending season. That means as long as people are growing produce, which is really fun. All right, so we have just a handful of minutes for a handful of questions. Uh, this is another lawn critter question. Wayne, uh, front lawn has tiny flying critters. They are too tiny to see other than a white dot. What are those? Okay. Most likely uh, they are what we call leaf hoppers. And they're just a small insect and I tend to see them more in lawns that have longer grass. When you cut your grass a little shorter, I don't see as many of them and maybe it's because you mow more and you chop more of them up in the long run. Okay. But they're usually not a pest problem in a, a turf situation. All right, perfect. Bill, we've had people ask us to give the two, three, four, five, six, seven step lawn care program. Yeah, it depends on how old your lawn is. Um, if you have a bluegrass lawn, you might want to be doing uh, three to six applications a year. Six if it's a brand new lawn, three if it's an established lawn, maybe over 15 years old. Tall fescue, uh, one to three applications. Um, don't do any applications after uh, we start really getting cold, so really after mid-October, late October, no more fertilizers. Good times to apply Memorial Day. If it's a newer lawn, actually during 4th of July, week area, slow release fertilizer. And then normally this time of year when we don't get six inches of rain. So it depends on how, how old the stand is, the soil, and the grass species. All right, thanks, Bill. Amy, um, we have a viewer who asked about whether we're seeing bacterial scorch in maples right now. It's the sidewalk street side. Is this is that environmental or is that bacterial if it's, scorch? If it's next to the sidewalk, I would probably lean toward environmental, but it's a little bit of sun scorch, uh, sidewalk scorch. Uh, just because it's that time of year, the trees are a little stressed, I wouldn't be too concerned about it at this point in time. All right. Elizabeth, um, a couple questions on digging and holding plants from a couple of different people. Good time of year to do that in, in a garage or what? Yep, if you have to um, and you don't have anywhere else that you're going to plant them immediately, you can go ahead and dig them, you can put them in a pot, um, you can either put them in a protected area and really mulch them really good. If you're talking daylilies, it's going to be hard to kill them. So, you know, just protect them from the winter winds. If you've got other plant material, you can go ahead, put them in a pot, put them in a, in a heated garage or a garage that's attached to the house so it's not going to get extremely cold. You can put them in the basement too, but you just want to make sure that they don't dry out completely and you want to make sure that they don't freeze either. All right, and, and kind of a follow-up on that is Ida Grove, of Iowa. Tender plants like the herbs, can they, can they be moved into the house? Is it worth it? She wants to dig them up and move them in. I've overwintered some of mine and they do okay. I mean, some of them are gonna get leggy if they don't get enough sunlight. Chives don't really like it very much, but they'll survive. Um, if they're those tender ones, go ahead and try. I've had cilantro come back several years in a row out in the middle of nowhere, so. Your, your guess is as good as mine if they're going to overwinter. All right, <laughs> cilantro, great. I know it's your favorite. I just love cilantro knots. <laughs> <laughs> it tastes like soap. <laughs> and it's genetic for those of you who don't know that.